move on to the topic and the status of women in Islam. I'm John Donvan of ABC News. This is an Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. We're at the Skirball Center for the Performing Arts in New York City. Our motion is Islam is a religion of peace. We have two teams of two arguing for the motion, Zeba Khan and, uh, sorry, Zeba Khan and Majid Nawaz and arguing against the motion, Ayan Hirsi Ali and Douglas Murray. One of the, here in the West, one of the issues that is very complicated for people in coming to terms with what they think Islam is, is the status of women in Islam. I'd like to go to Zeba Khan, take that on, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the perception is that a lot, for a lot of people out looking at the Muslim world and Muslim majority countries is that Muslim women are somehow, they aren't, um, they're, they're, they're subjugated that they don't um, to a point where they are intimidated to ask for their rights and to, to demand them, but that's not the case. I mean, when you look at all, when you look across uh, Muslim majority countries, if you look at Iran, for example, where there's zero gender gap in education, by the way, um, men and women enjoy the same amount of education. Obviously, when you're, that, when you're at that level of education, you're, you're aware of what your rights are and what, you're, what you are demanding. And so, you know, in, in Iran and places like that, they are demanding their rights. They are um, pushing for them. Um, in places like Afghanistan or Pakistan, where the, where, where the gender gap is larger, um, that gap obviously needs to be filled, but there are women who are pushing there as well. There, it's not, um, it's, it's women that are stepping up and taking the lead on this. Other side response? Ayan Hirsi Ali. Well, when I try to define Islam as a religion, religion is expression. What you find in the Quran is expression after expression, verse after verse, and also in the Hadith, that women are subordinate to men, that they have a guardian, they need to have a guardian, their testimony is worth half of that of men, in, they can only inherit what, half of what their brother inherits. When it comes to sexual offenses, women are the ones who get in reality where Sharia is implemented, and that is not only the practical side of Islam, but also the fellowship side of Islam, everywhere where Sharia is implemented. And there are more places in the world today where Sharia as a family law is implemented, where it's not implemented on a political level, but in all of those places you see a subjugation of women. You see honor killings. You see women who are denied education. If you look on a global level, the levels of illiteracy among women in the Middle East is appalling. That's not something that I'm telling you because I'm, you know, whatever. Uh, I misunderstand Islam, but that is report after report. And the latest one is the United Nations uh, uh, UNDP Human Development Report that was first published in 2002, and that was again published in 2003, 2004. And if you follow these reports, this is empirics. This is not uh, something that I'm imagining. The situation of women in the Middle East in Muslim countries is dire. And the principles, the principles that underlie it and the practices are Islamic. It's Sharia law in action. And the appalling, the nightmare, the nightmare is women who have fled those countries, who are now in the West, citizen, American citizens, European citizens, are subjected to parts of Sharia law. And Ziba, I think that denying that kind of, not just as a matter of debate, but I then try to question where does your solidarity lie as a woman who grew up in a free country, a free woman, and as vocal as you are, shouldn't you be more solidar with them? I am. I am. But I don't want to, I don't want to, the, the, I absolutely am, and as all women should be, and actually all human beings should, to, to demand the rights of equality. In fact, most Muslims want equal rights for their, for the women in their societies. And if you, and if it goes to, just go to the research, go to the polls, go to the research on what it says. When you ask men, should women have equal rights? Majority in, 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 in the country surveyed, in, in, in the Gallup survey, said yes, they should have equal rights, including in Saudi Arabia. So, so just, yeah, just, um, I want to acknowledge that there, a lot more needs to be done and a lot more needs to be said about uh, eliminating some of the practices that you refer to, Ayan. And I, I, I recognize uh, that there are practices in Muslim-majority societies across the world that are rep repugnant, not just to a Western mind, but generally to anyone, any decent, rational human being. Um, but I want to approach this being a man, uh, and the first man on the panel to comment on this question. Great. I want to approach this from a slightly different angle, and that is this. 
that uh, many of you in the audience are men, and if, if the law of average was to, to, to fall true, then you'd be probably around 50%. Now, how many of you uh, would be comfortable with your spouse, your wife, as your boss at the same time? Uh, and it may sound, you know, it may actually be a truism because for many people in a marriage, the boss is the wife. But the reason I'm asking that question is that even in times like today, many men find that uncomfortable to be married to their boss. And yet, Ayan, who referred to these practices that were repugnant to us and said that they are sourced in Islam, the founder of Islam, the Prophet Muhammad, his boss, his first wife, was his boss. And many people don't know that. And so what I want to uh, demonstrate by this point is that it's a complex matter. There are practices in Muslim-majority societies that we need to reform, but it's too simplistic to trace them back to the life of a man who lived 1,400 years ago and in many of his practices was quite revolutionary for his time, and in others was like every other man during his time. So the fact that he referred to, Douglas referred to the fact that he had, uh, that he had a bride that was underage is something which we can now look back on and say, that was an awful practice. But we, just as we look back on, on many things that Romans did and say that was an awful practice, just as we look back on many things that Martin Luther did and said that was an awful practice, but we don't judge these men by All the right. standards that we have let's today. Bring, let's bring in Douglas no, Murray. No, no, we do, and we should. Um, we should, Majid. And may I say, it's a bit too cutesy to compare a man who raped a nine-year-old girl repeatedly with uh, men being, you know, kind of, you know, the wife's a bit of the you know, master of the household and so on. A bit too cutesy and a bit too much avoiding the issue, which is this, that this is actually a very real concern, which doesn't just apply in mid-seventh century Arabia, but today, here and now, in Britain, in my own country, we now have, uh, thanks to, the, uh, to, to an arbitration act put into a law in the 1990s, whereby people can uh, have uh, civil disputes arbitrated uh, under, under laws that they, they, they can decide on, that we now have Sharia courts in Great Britain. And the Sharia courts that in Br Great Britain are operated by people who are actually uh, clerics. They are um, uh, religious authorities. There's one at the moment, you know, him, well, Siddiqui in, uh, in, in Leicestershire. Uh, now, uh, now, this man runs a set of Sharia courts. A couple of years ago, it turned out that we, we found out a little bit about the sort of thing he was, he was deciding. And sadly, again, it's not reformist stuff, because when you go back to the Sharia, people take the lessons from it, and they make judgments like the following. Six women, six women who had gone to the Sharia courts because they were being physically abused by their husbands, uh, they were persuaded to drop the cases because this should be a matter between a Muslim woman and her Muslim husband and the Sharia court. This should not be a matter for the police in Great Britain in 2008. That stinks. What's more, there was in another case, a local man, a local Muslim man died. His will was arbitrated by Sharia because that was, that was what happens now in 21st century Britain. And the arbitration of this man's will gave half the inheritance to the daughters as to the sons of the man because that's what you have in the Quran. But so it's all very might, well to say might just that it's something actually said that he agrees with you that this stuff needs to yeah, change. But the point is, is that when you look at the courts that are doing this, when you look at the religious authorities, <laughs> when you look at the clerics, the judgments they're making, those are the kinds of judgments. I wish that Majid would get some clerics on his side who could set up rival Sharia courts that didn't decide that women were second-class citizens. But sadly, at the moment, that is the case. So, Douglas, actually, I, the irony was, that, as was. you know well, that the person who came out most publicly in support of those regrettable Sharia courts in the UK uh, was the Archbishop of Canterbury. And we at Quilliam opposed their creation. And actually, many Muslims in Britain do oppose their creation because it raises the question. Islam has never had a clergy. It's never had a pope. And so when you try and institute Sharia courts as law, the question arises, whose Sharia do you follow? Now, that's an internal debate that's going on and raging and that I'm part of in Pakistan, for example, because there isn't one version of Sharia. And everything you've referred to is bad. We condemn these practices, but the fact is we can't call them, we can't be reductionist, essentialist, simplistic, lack nuance and call it Sharia, because there isn't one Sharia, as you well know, just as there isn't one reading of Shakespeare. All right, I want to yeah, move on, and when we...